On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including SpaceX, Starship, and Starlink prepare for orbit, how Rocket Lab sent Capstone to the moon, China looking ahead to new missions, and Thor helping us spot asteroids. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. SpaceX has begun sprinting to the finish as they lock in the final upgrades to their orbital Starship rocket S-24. An environmental green light from the FAA on June 13th put the wind into the sails of Elon Musk's aerospace company and launched Starbase Texas into the final phase of preparations to test and launch the single largest and most powerful flying machine ever created. Over the weekend of June 24th, the orbital candidate Ship 24 was lifted on a crane in the High Bay Construction Building to be fitted with the six Raptor vacuum engines. This is a significant upgrade from the original Starship design that had three Raptor vac engines. These vacuum engines are distinguished by the significantly larger nozzle, and you can think of them essentially like a space-optimized version of the same engine that lifts the rocket off the ground. After the ship clears the atmosphere and separates from its super-heavy booster, these six vacuum engines will fire to push the Starship and its 100-plus tons of cargo into the desired orbital path, or even to the moon or the planet Mars. This comes after we've seen the first stage, Super Heavy Booster, fitted with all 33 of its Raptor 2 boost engines. The completion of engine integration marks the first time a full Starship and booster prototype have been equipped for an orbital launch. No one is sure yet when a live fire attempt could happen, but with both test candidates ready to go, we shouldn't have to wait very long for the big show. In the meantime, Ship 24 was also seen getting fitted with the first ever Starlink loader device, so we know that SpaceX will leverage the extreme power of the Starship to deploy their second generation of larger and more capable Starlink satellites. And we know that they also have a new plan for how Starship will deliver those new Starlinks into orbit. Right now, when a Falcon 9 second stage deploys a batch of Starlinks, it will just release the entire group of 60 satellites in one big cluster. The ship will rotate slightly as it lets go, and then centrifugal force will cause the satellites to disperse as they float away. With Starship, SpaceX has invented a new mechanical deployer that will actually spit each satellite out one by one through a slot in the side of the ship. It's like a giant Pez dispenser in space. On June 30th, the mechanical Starlink satellite loader was lifted up to the payload bay of S-24 and then lowered again after some time. Good money is on the engineers testing loading procedures next, maybe by using an actual Starlink V2 dummy. The specialized payload bay is something new for this version of Starship, but it's not the only thing. Many subtle changes have been made to the vehicle, especially when we compare it to an older launch candidate like S-20. The main differences are in the organization of the internal systems on S-24. Obviously, the inclusion of the Starlink dispenser meant that some internals would be moved around, but we can't forget that S-24 has more engines and so structural and plumbing needs were recalculated as well. The nose cone, previously made of four rows of stamped and welded panels, has now been made of two rows of stretch-formed panels instead, saving weight. The rings that form the hull of Starship were shuffled, some sections losing rings, others gaining them. A new aft cone, for instance, which was needed to accommodate the new Raptor V2 engines, came with shrinking the section by one ring. The methane header tank was also removed from the common dome section at the middle of the ship, in favor of mounting it into the nose cone section, seemingly to accommodate the plumbing of the new liquid oxygen tank vents or ullage thruster vents. Those vents are probably the biggest change, as SpaceX removed the usual reaction control systems used for maneuvering in zero-g in favor of using liquid oxygen venting systems to perform the same role. They already had to vent the gas, so why not save the weight? It's a solution that's already being implemented in Booster 7 and onward. 
Now, speaking of boosters, the Booster 7 test tank has been put through its paces on the can crusher apparatus and seemed to do just fine. As we fly forward towards the engine burn tests of both the S24 and Booster 7, it's really exciting to see all this work getting done simultaneously. And sure, testing might expose some new problems we haven't seen before. After all, SpaceX has never tested their full array of Raptor V2s on completed prototypes before. But with any luck, all that work to reinforce and rebalance Starship and its boosters will pay off and we'll get a smooth show in the next few weeks. Rocket Lab, an aerospace startup from New Zealand, has executed a picture-perfect moon launch. Their small electron rocket, made to efficiently place small satellites into low Earth orbit, is right now carrying a device the size of a microwave into position for a four-month journey to orbit the moon. Capstone will range ahead of the future Artemis moon missions, gathering the critical orbital telemetry needed for humanity's next step into our solar neighborhood. But the journey to get the Capstone satellite to that orbit is every bit as remarkable. Just to be clear, this isn't a story about superior technology or more efficient engines. This is about ingenuity. When Apollo went to the moon, they achieved the feat aboard a massive Atlas V rocket brute force sending them screaming to the lunar surface in about 4.5 days. Atlas V weighed roughly 140 tons and stood 110.6 meters tall. Rocket Lab took their 18 meter long 14.3 ton electron platform and rigged it to send a payload over 1.3 million kilometers farther than the rocket was designed to and to an orbit so finicky that we need Capstone to scout it for us in case it doesn't work for the larger objects we plan to send. They achieve this by using clever orbital tricks and razor-thin weight margins. Looping the payload several times around the Earth before lobbing it carefully towards the Moon. The first step was weight. The Capstone satellite was mounted to a kick stage a part of the rocket normally used to place a satellite in its final orbit with smaller maneuvering thrusters. Capstone's kick stage was a bit more advanced. Coming in at 121 pounds, Photon is more of a full stage than it is a kicker. It's Hypercurry engine being the key to getting to the moon. The 55 pound CubeSat was bolted to Photon and that plus the payload rig came to about 661 pounds the max Electron is rated for. But it was the little things that needed some changing to keep Electron at its operational weight. For example, extra telemetry reportedly was the reason the usual launch cameras weren't taken this time. But after all the fiddling, Electron's techs were able to offset the extra gear and the rocket left the pad at its max weight of roughly 14.7 tons. This is where ingenuity had to make the difference because at this operational weight, Electron could only get the payload into orbit pretty far from the moon. Photon still had its hypercurry engine, but the small vehicle didn't have a lot of fuel packed for the trip to the moon, and the satellite had to save its thrusters to get into a very specific orbit once there. So, like any good space agency, Rocket Lab cheated. There's a trick in orbital mechanics called the Oberth effect. Essentially, as a vehicle is approaching the part of its orbit where it will be the closest to the body it's floating around, it can boost towards the direction of its momentum to gain speed. Gravity helps so much at this point that it's very fuel efficient. Think of it as kicking your legs out as you head downwards on a swing. Same general effect. Photon performed seven orbits, and on each one, the hypercurry activated and pushed Capstone's orbit just a little further out each time. On the seventh boost, something wild happened. Keen space fans will note that the moon is only 384,000 kilometers from Earth, and earlier, we mentioned Capstone would be flying a whopping 1.3 million kilometers out. Well, that's because on the seventh boost, Photon pushed Capstone out past the effective gravity of both the Earth and the Moon and let the Sun take the wheel. Over the course of the next four months, Capstone is going to be way out in space, not going fast enough to escape, but just far out enough to let the Sun's gravity push the craft 
curving gracefully towards the moon. Once there, the satellite will set itself up in a near rectilinear halo orbit, calculated to be both stable and to have constant line of sight to the Earth, and begin its mission to investigate. If this orbit works the way the math says it should, then Capstone is likely to see some neighbors over the course of the next few years. But that's a story for later. Right now, we're just geeking out over the complexity and precision needed to make Rocket Lab's electron deliver a payload to the moon using nothing more than a bit of gravitational trickery. This is what makes rocketry fans cheer. This sort of clever thinking and engineering handiwork is what will get us to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. So, bravo Rocket Lab. The Chinese Academy of Sciences is looking ahead to future missions and has trimmed their list of potential operations down to just 13 over four fields of study. All predictions are the CAS will whittle that number down even further to about five to seven missions, which will make up their third strategic priority program project or New Horizons program. These missions will be decided over the course of the next couple of months and will solidify China's focus and schedule for the next five-year plan, 2026 to 2030. In space astronomy and astrophysics, the candidates are looking to study gravitational waves and neutrinos, look for dark matter, and study the early universe. In exoplanet study, we have two very similar cases, the CHES and the ET missions. Both would be placed in the Sun-Earth Lagrange point and would be searching for exoplanets. CHESS would use reference points to math out where exoplanets are, while ET would be using light levels to sniff them out. Heliophysics has four missions vying for funding, all of them trying out different orbital inclinations to study parts of the sun itself, from the poles to using the Earth to block the sun so they can view the inner corona. And finally, in planetary and Earth sciences, we have the last four proposals. Asteroid exploration, Earth ocean and climate observatories, and most excitingly, a Venus orbiter concept meant to investigate volcanoes and climate processes on our sister planet. All of these missions, of course, are building on the second strategic priority missions, the last of which are launching this year and next, but just like with NASA's Capstone and Trailblazer missions, they're clearly building up to something. And whatever that something is, China's stated space goals are being planned with international cooperation in mind. In a paper put out by Wang Qi, director of the National Space Science Center, NSSC, he said that the New Horizons is an effective approach to promote China's space activities and make great contributions to international space science and exploration. Which is very good to hear. China's space industry is exploding, making huge leaps and bounds, and the missions we just went over are a tiny slice of what they have planned. The moon, Mars, asteroids, Jupiter, Venus, the sun, they really aren't pulling any punches. Having two major forces for scientific discovery operating right now at the cusp of so many new endeavors into local space is way more useful than just one. It really highlights how we're going to achieve the goal of putting humans on Mars and beyond inside this next decade or so. We will do it together. Astronomers are constantly scanning our space for signs of dangerously close asteroids. Ever since the Tunguska impact in 1908, we have been acutely aware that we could get smacked at any time. So far, scientists have been successful at finding asteroids, comets, and other objects but it's hard work. Thankfully, we have a new method of spotting potentially dangerous rocks, Thor. Now, as funny as the image of Chris Hemsworth out there with binoculars is, Thor in this case stands for Tracketless Heliocentric Orbit Recovery, and it's greatly speeding up our methods of seeing the more dangerous asteroids before they can potentially be a problem. Currently, astronomers have to find asteroids the hard way, which isn't difficult, it just takes a lot of time. It starts with a regular observation. A viewer will pick a spot and take a picture. Then they wait a bit and take another. Because stars don't really move on a timeline of hours or days, it's pretty easy to spot which objects are closer and moving, denoting some sort of space chunk. 
Astronomers use three points of reference and draw lines to mark the movement. From there, they can calculate an orbit for the potentially dangerous object, and these lines are called tracklets. There's a bunch more complications, of course. It's not quite as easy as that. Our own orbit makes visual calculations like this difficult for a computer to adjust for, not the least because as an object is being observed by us, we're both moving, so often the tracklets can get jumbled or we just lose track of the object altogether. Then there's the problem of the scale of our surveys. Often large surveys will discover and catalog millions of asteroids, and calculating those orbits can take quite a while. So here is where Thor comes in. Thor throws the whole tracklet thing out the nearest window and says, why don't we track orbits instead of sightings? Basically, it works like this. An astronomer using Thor calculates a test orbit, a range of space they would like to scan to see if any asteroids are there. With those parameters in hand, a computer can sift through images and data according to where the test orbit says they should be and when, instead of discovering them by chance. This way, if we're worried about objects entering an orbit that could lead to a collision, we can search that orbit and find really important rocks first instead of sifting through mounds of data to find the potential problems. When they tested Thor on Zwicky Transient Facility's data, Thor was able to confirm more than 97% of asteroids found with the usual methods. In addition, when fed new data from the Noir Lab Source catalog, astronomers used Thor to find 104 new asteroids in a month's worth of observational data. Not bad for calculations starting with a guess. Every single new asteroid found could be potentially dangerous, so finding them first has been a pivotal part of our observational systems for decades, and any new methods that could help us in our never-ending quest to keep an eye on the sky is more than welcome. In fact, it's kind of essential. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.